before I start lecturing, were there any questions about anything that we, we did yesterday? We covered quite a bit of ground, but if there are any outstanding questions conceptually or technically, you know, I budgeted about 15 minutes to talk about any of that. If this is your first time using App8, you know, don't expect all this to make sense all at once over the course of just two days. It's, it's a lot of material and it's, it's very complex. And really, uh, you know, a lot of this has been guided for the most part. So I haven't given you a whole lot of free time to do things on your own. Because at this point, there's, there's not a whole lot that you probably could, could do on your own, just given the, the limited number of commands that we've been doing. But as we'll be doing later today, um, we'll be working through an MVP data set, actually a couple. And for one of them, it's going to be... Uh, recapping everything we've done so far. Right, so we'll actually be pre-processing the data set. We'll be making decisions about how to do that, how to choose our region of interest to, to do the analysis, and then making sense of it. So if that all sounds good, let's get to the actual lecture, which is region of interest analysis. Let me see if this... Uh, I'm going to turn off the lights. Is that okay? Good. Okay. Yeah. yeah, here we go, here we go. <coughs> so ROI analysis, what to, what to say about ROI analysis? Well, it's a natural outgrowth of everything we've done so far. So we did a group level analysis. Now, I, I just gave you the, the group level results that I had already analyzed. If you would run all the single subject analyses, which would take you know, quite a bit of time, but we'll, we'll see how to do that with scripting, you would take all those single subject results, you would feed it to a group level analysis, those parameter estimates, and uh, the t-test as well if you're doing something like 3D MEMA. And then we used AVNI to view the results, and we used 3D full of half max and 3D plus sim to determine whether any of these clusters were significant. So, so far, you know, conceptually that's, that's not too difficult. There were a lot of details, obviously, in how to use things like 3D full of half max, how to use things like 3D clusum, and use the apnea GUI. And there's a lot of stuff within the apnea GUI and within those commands that we didn't touch on, but those are the basics that you would need to run start to finish any kind of task related design. It really is it. Now applying it to say a new data set or your own data is you know it's quite difficult. But you should be able to do it, given what we've talked about so far. Now, what we've done is a whole brain analysis. It's very common. It's common for those to be reported. But if somebody wants to make a stronger claim about a specific region of the brain and how it's involved in some kind of process or processing some stimulus, we use something called region of interest or ROI analysis. And I like to define this as restricting your analysis to a subset of voxels. So instead of looking at this entire Rubik's Cube composed of smaller cubes or voxels, we chisel out a subset of those and we extract data from it in order to say something about that specific region that we extracted from. We'll be going through a couple of different ways to do this. One is through a command called 3D undump to create a spherical ROI, very common. The other one is by using an atlas to define a region on a template of the brain, and then you extract data from that. There's also Neurosense at the very end, which is a very, very cool online platform, easy to use, and you can use it to define meta-analyses for a region of interest. So, overview of the practical that we'll do is we'll talk about what ROIs are. <laughs> we'll go through a few different ways to create ROIs, and then I'll give you the code to do ROI analysis with both atlases and 3D undump. And there's kind of uh, there's like lecture part B, which is talking about ROI concepts, because even though I'll be giving you the the methods to do these ROI analyses, it's very important that you do them appropriately. There's been a lot of you know, chatter lately about these things called unbiased or non-independent or circular analyses. Does any, does any of that sound familiar? Has anybody heard of it? 
Unbiased, or sorry, bias analyses, yeah. We'll get to that. Uh, it's important because really ROI analyses have been abused for a long time <laughs> to give us uh, effect sizes which are probably inflated and a distortion of what's really going on. So it's important to actually uh, make sure that we're doing it correctly. Okay, so let's begin with what an ROI is. Like I said, an ROI, or region of interest, is a subset of voxels that you want to restrict your analysis to. And we do this primarily to increase power and increase spatial specificity. It can be defined based on a couple of things. It can be based on theory. So let's say that some process we think activates a certain region. Or it could be based upon coordinates that are reported from another study. So if they're looking at something similar that you looked at, and you want to use an independent data set, you can use their peak coordinates to define your region of interest. Both are appropriate. So let me show you a brief animation of what ROIs are so we know what we're dealing with. And also how we use them. So all these result maps that we created, think of these again as big Rubik's cubes. So instead of individual volumes, now we have individual contrast maps. And you'll have as many of these cubes as you do contrasts that you tested. So for example, if you did three contrasts, you'll have three of these giant Rubik's cubes. Now each of these contrast maps are in turn composed of smaller cubes or voxels. And if we zoom in on one contrast, and let's say we chisel out a 2 by 2 by 2 subregion, that is an ROI. And again, just like with the original time series we looked at, in these ROIs, they also contain an individual number representing either a beta estimate or a contrast estimate for each voxel, for each subject. In an ROI analysis, we just average across all those numbers to get a single number per subject for that contrast or condition. We do this for all of our subjects. And then you get one number per subject, you run a t-test on those numbers, and then you publish it. <laughs> I photoshopped that, uh, <laughs> that thing. I didn't actually publish something in scientific reports. It was. OK. So clear so far. Do you want to see any of those steps again? OK. All right. OK, so now let's turn to how to create the ROI, which is going to be focus of the practical of the workshop. So as I mentioned, there are two main ways to create ROIs. Um, you can create an anatomical ROI through any one of the atlases that come with uh, AFNI. And we'll look at a couple of them. Uh, where am I right now? I'm oh, sorry. And the other one is by creating a sphere centered around the peak coordinates, let's say that you got from another paper examining a similar study that you did. Uh, for the anatomical one, let's say we decide to use a singlet cortex as an anatomical ROI. Uh, we would you know, chisel out those voxels defined by the atlas as belonging to the singlet. And then we would extract data just from those voxels. Just to show a 3D representation of what that would look like. If, on the other hand, you used a spherical ROI based on peak coordinates, you would locate the peak coordinate from another paper, and then we would use 3D on dump to inflate the sphere around that coordinate, and we would extract data only from those voxels that fall within that sphere. So let's say the peak coordinates were x0, y30, z30. We create a sphere of a certain radius, uh, typically radii of about 5 are used. Sometimes 10, depends on what the, the sizes of the region you're looking at. But those are pretty typical. If you use something like 7 or 8, it may raise questions about why you chose that particular radius. I'm just telling you the, the defaults usually are 5 or 10. I like 5 because you have less of a chance of having the sphere actually spill into, say, non brain areas or white matter or ventricles. Um, but at the same time, if you're dealing with, say, a very small region, let's say the amygdala or some subcortical region, you may want a 3-millimeter sphere. 
because it's a very small region, and anything larger than that could easily grab onto non-brain areas. Excuse me. Clear? I'm okay. Good. This, this is a really important concept because the the end goal of most studies is to do an ROI analysis. So if you can do that, I mean, most studies do it, so you're in pretty good shape if you can do that. Uh, the reason that you know I chose this particular data set, besides the fact that it's pretty simple and we're able to do a lot of the basic fMRI processing and stats and all that sort of is that within the paper, this is back in 2008, I think, uh, this top panel here shows their both positive and uh, negative activations or deactivations for uh, congruent, so congruent on this top row, and incongruent on this bottom row. Now, in the paper, they claim that incongruent is greater than congruent in this area. But just based on these maps alone, you can't necessarily say that. I'll well, we'll show you why. We need to do an ROI analysis, or at least do some kind of contrast between the two, to make that determination. I'll get to, sorry, I'll get to double dissociations in a little bit. Okay, so the first way we're going to create ROIs, this is pretty fun. We do it all through the ACME GUI, and we use atlases to uh, define voxels that we believe belong to a specific anatomical area. So in this case, we'll create something like the, the mid-singulate because, you know, that may be a good candidate for looking at something like cognitive control. But you can really use anything you want. And ACME comes with, I forget how many atlases, at least half a dozen, I think. And within those atlases, as you'll see, there are many different labels you can select from. So I could select a singlet, I could select different zones of the singlet, I could select the you know, pre-SMA, the oral frontal cortex, really whatever you want. But, <clears throat> uh, and what I'll make more explicit when we talk about bias analyses, you really should choose this before you look at your second level results. Otherwise, if you already know where your significant results are, and then you try to define an, uh, an ROI, that leads to uh, this, this so-called non-independence or, or biased error. Okay. Uh, word of caution, this caused me a lot of pain when I was first doing this. The mask or ROI, I use mask and ROI interchangeably. And the data dimensions you're extracting from, they have to match exactly. So they have to have the same voxel dimensions and they have to have the same field of view. Most atlases that you use, either in AFNI or if you choose to use one from FSL or SPM, they're usually at a different resolution from the stats data set. Not always, but you need to check just to make sure or else you're going to get an error. And the way to do this is with something called resampling. The command is through your resample, you specify the master data set which is being resampled to. So in other words, if we wanted to resample to our stats data set, we're saying keep the stats data set the same. Don't do anything to it. Which is usually a good option because we don't want to introduce any more interpolations to our actual data. And then inset, you provide whatever ROI that you created from an atlas or uh, you know, what have you. And then the prefix is whatever you want the output to be called. Um, I don't have an animation for this, unfortunately, but resampling uh, conceptually should make sense. I mean, really, so if we had two gigantic Rubik's cubes and one had you know, 100 smaller cubes, this other one had 130 cubes, and we couldn't use them for the same analysis. You'd have to resample it or, in other words, you know, change the size of the cubes in one of them to match the number and the size of the other one. 
if anybody do, does anybody here have like a really strong uh, graphic animation background <laughs> I'm, I'm considering hiring somebody because I have ideas <laughs> about how I want this to look I'm, I'm dead serious I think this is could be really useful uh, I'll keep looking <laughs> I don't know. It takes a lot of time. I yeah. mean, to, to create some of that stuff, it takes. It's not easy. All right. So doing the the ROI analysis, we're going to concatenate all the uh, say all those contrast maps that we're going to be extracting from. So we saw that previous animation where we you know daisy chain all these data sets together. We're doing the same thing, and conceptually, it's related to this this time series that we extract, or this time series that we have for each data set. Right? So for a typical fMRI data set, let's say there's 100 volumes, we have snapshot 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 100. Now we're doing something similar in that we're creating a data set that has uh, you know, a so-called time dimension, but we're just stringing together contrast maps like on a string together, and then we're extracting from that. You have a script in your uh, in your Flinker directory called extractbetas.sh. Uh, this is really a template. I'm not going to use this exact same command, but I'll walk through a little bit of what this is doing because scripting is also something that we're going to talk about a little bit today. If this is your first foray into Unix and any kind of coding, just, just bear with me. It may not totally click or make sense today, but I promise if you keep using it, it will. Um, first of all, in our scripts, we have this thing called a shebang. It's a technical term. Okay? Uh, where the, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking. Uh, it's a hashtag, exclamation mark, and then you provide an absolute path to whichever shell you're using. Obviously. Right? <laughs> But this lets it know that everything else in this script is being interpreted in T-shell syntax. So the major shells that we have are bash and T-shell. <laughs> A lot of people say, you know, bash is superior, why would you use T-shell? I'm not going to argue that point. This is something <laughs> that I'm totally unqualified to speak to. But the reason I'm coding everything in T-shell is because Afni codes all of their scripts in T-shell. Everything that, that was being output from that, that proc script is in T-shell format. So what that means is the syntax is going to be slightly different from T-shell to bash. The way that we write things like uh, these for loops, for example, or if-else statements, they do the same thing, but the way that we write them is going to be different. If you're new to coding, the most important Part of coding, I would say that you're going to come across is something called a for loop. This iteratively does a certain command across however many subjects you want it to do. So let me unpack this, and I'll show you a couple examples uh, in a little bit. For each, it says we're doing a for loop. Sub, subj, dev, is just whatever you want to call this variable which is within these parentheses. Now, this is a little bit advanced, but what I like to do is use backticks to expand whatever is within the backticks. I've given you this uh, text file called subjlist, SUBJ list. That contains each subject's name. So sub01, sub02, sub03, and so on everything that you see in your Flinker directory. If I type cat sublist, this is going to return a column of every, everything in that text file. And you can, you can type this as cat sublist if you're in the Flinker directory to see what that looks like. You should see one column as all your subject names. So what this for, for loop is going to do is going to take the first element in whatever's been expanded here, so sub01 in this case, and it's going to use that as a variable in subj. 
if I want to call upon that within this 3D bucket command, I need to give it, I need to put a dollar sign in front of it. Again, the first time this is going to seem totally arbitrary, and it really kind of is. But we use that to then say, okay, in this iteration of the for loop, replace dollar sign SUBJ with sub 01, same thing here, same thing here. And 3D bucket is a way to uh, concatenate all these data sets together. So I'm looping through every subject in my directory, and I'm gluing that onto this bucket data set, which is just a bunch of data sets concatenated together. Last thing I want to point out here is you have something called a sub-brick selector in Appy. Very, very useful. If you use 3D info like we used yesterday, it tells you which of those sub-bricks or volumes within the data set corresponds to what, right? So for example, on a stats data set, we have our congruent coefficient, congruent t-stat, incongruent coefficient, incongruent t-stat, and so on. Hello. In this case, I know, because I use 3D info, that sub brick 4 corresponds to the incongruent data map. And so I call my glue 2 data set that's going to be a concatenation of all these beta maps, incongruent betas, and then I use the sub brick selector to pick number 4. And the syntax is it needs to be in uh, brackets. So just keep this in mind. Um, we'll play around with it a little bit. You know, we'll have a couple different options. Uh, I'll be asking you, okay, what what subric do we want to select? How are we going to determine which one to select? How do we see it? And then we'll look at a couple different ROI analyses for different contrast maps. Then you can extract the data with either 3D mask app or 3D ROI stats. And the syntax for this is 3D mask app. You give it the mask with the mask play. Let's say I created a, a mid ACC ROI. And then the very last argument or input is going to be those incongruent betas that I extracted. What's returned from this is a string of numbers. I'm going to get one number per subject. So if I have 26 subjects in my data set, how many numbers am I going to get? 26. Yeah. At that point, really, it's just a matter of copying, pasting that into Excel or R or whatever you want to use for your stats, and then running an ROI analysis. Okay. Just repeating what I said before. This treats the concatenated beta maps as a time series, and then for each subject, averages over the voxels within the mask. Questions about this? This is. This is the engine driving everything we're going to be doing with our line analysis. Yeah? I'm curious about this, but how, did you, how do you know which subbrick you want for them? Yeah, we're going to use 3D info. And that, kills, that tells you what label is assigned to which subbrick. So when you run your stats, uh, when you run your first level analysis, um, based on the, just the timing files that you give, right? It says, okay, this particular subric is the beta weight for congruent, or this particular subric is the beta weight for uh, congruent, or sorry, the t statistic for congruent, and so on. Um, we'll see it. It's it's easier to see in action and to, to make the connection. So we concatenate first the all the files and then yeah. make the mask and then the strat. Yeah. The exactly. Files. Yeah. Yep. Concatenate all the files, create the mask, and then use mask app or ROI stats. Uh, ROI stats does the same thing mask app does, but if you have multiple masks with different indices, it will output a different, um, different average for each column. I'm not going to get into that today, unfortunately. It is very useful if you have multiple ROIs that you're extracting from. But you can ask me during one of the breaks if you want to know more about it. Okay, spherical ROIs. So we're going to cover atlases and extracting anatomical regions from the GUI. But what if we have an ROI that was based on another study? 
So for example, if I read in some paper, and I'm looking at you know, prediction error conflict, and I saw that, okay, uh, something like conflict effects that might be somewhat related to this incongruent effect I'm looking at, you know, they're both recruiting executive function. And I found that the MNI coordinates for that peak in that other paper were 0, 20, 44. This is something I'd be looking for if I wanted to make a spherical ROI based on another paper. The command is called 3D undump for reasons I <laughs> am not completely clear about, but it looks a little something like this. Uh, it's getting cut off a little bit over here. But again, this is a T-shell script. I'm typing echo and then quotations what the coordinates are. You'll be playing around with this a little bit during the practical. So from that paper, I knew that the coordinates for that, for that peak activation for conflict were 0, 20, 44. Okay. A little bit more Unix stuff, if you're ready for it. I'm not, I'm not wild about teaching this because it's, I feel weird doing it. But a few things going on here to make this command compact and... You know, generalizable. I have this thing called a pipe. You'll see this sometimes in different Unix scripts. What the pipe means is take whatever was on this left side of the pipe, and if it finds a dash in isolation, it, you know, it's not tied to any of these uh, options, replace that with wh whatever was the result from the left side of the pipe. So echo 02044 is going to return just 02044 as a string. Yeah? And that's going to be input over here. 3D undump requires a few different options. There's the orientation. Okay, let's get back to that a little bit. SRAD is the radius of the sphere in millimeters. Five is a, a default that I like. Uh, the master data set I'm going to leave as the incongruent betas, or whatever statistics I'm extracting from. And then prefix. Uh, Conflict ROI is going to be the, the name of the output ROI data set. So the mass containing the voxels I'm going to extract from is going to be called conflict ROI. And then lastly, XYZ, it's going to look for whatever's on the left side of that pipe. So 0, 20, 44. Now remember yesterday I talked about the orientation and AFNI is RAI, which is kind of weird. I don't like it. So this is why when I'm using 3D undump, I'm specifying that the orientation of whatever I was, uh, the coordinates that I was using from another paper were in this LPI format. In other words, going from left to right is negative to positive, from posterior to anterior is negative to positive, and from inferior to superior goes from negative to positive. It, 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 this... This fact that AFNI is an RI orientation makes, makes things a little bit more complicated than I would like, but that's the way that I get around it and override it. Right. What, what that's saying is, yeah, it does actually. So it says this, this original uh, mm -hmm. coordinates are in, were an LPI oh. orientation, but map them onto AFNI's RAI, RAI orientation. So even though it's 20 in API, which would normally be more superior, it would get matched and yeah. it would be interpreted as negative 20? Right. So if I didn't include this, so, so x, y, z, y in LPI format or neurological orientation would be 20 millimeters anterior of the anterior commissure. Sorry, it's a lot of stuff. I don't want to get too far into this. But the anterior commissure is like zero for going from posture to anterior. So it would be 20 millimeters um, anterior to that. If I was, if I didn't include the orient information and just defaulted to AFNIs, it would say, oh, that's actually 20 millimeters behind. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, are we creating the ROIs in standard space or not here? Good question. We are creating the ROIs in standard space. So yeah. first we have to like resample our, our data set to the standard? 
Um, so your data set already is in standard space. These statistical data sets have been resampled to MNI space. Oh, okay. Um, the only, th when I'm talking about resampling for the ROIs, they're also in MNI space for the most part, unless you use like a Tallyrack Atlas, which we're not going to do. We're going to use MNI Atlases. So they're in MNI space, but they may be at a slightly, in a slightly different resolution. So we resample to make sure that their resolution is the same. That's the whole purpose of a 3D resample. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Does anyone know how to do a pipe on a PC? A pipe on a PC? Like what? Oh, no. Is that not... Is... It's shift, shift and the button above enter. The top symbol, it looks like there's a break in there. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so we're going to do that for the ROI analysis. Just a few more slides here. But even though you've done an ROI analysis, here are a few things you really need to keep in mind when you're doing that. Um, if, say, we did an ROI analysis and we just extracted contrast estimates for, say, something like left minus right button presses, right? Uh, let me be clear here. So let's say that we extract... Let's say we had uh, just left and right button presses, nothing too complicated. And we had an anatomical ROI, let's say in the right motor cortex. We extract all those contrast estimates and we get something like this for this left minus right contrast. So that's great, but it's very hard to determine uh, what is driving the effect. So what could contribute to this contrast estimate, it could be that left actually is you know, more positive than, than the right condition. Um, it could be that right is just way more negative than left, but you still get that if you take this minus this, right? positive minus a negative. Or it could be some combination of the two. You really don't know unless you use your ROI analysis to extract the constituent parts of that contrast. Okay. Last part of this is, I'll say a few words about double dissociations because they're pretty popular in the field. Um, you can also use ROIs to test for double dissociations. Um, that's, for example, let's say one condition activates this region, but not this region, and another condition activates this region, but not that region. In our current example, we may want to test whether left button presses are selective for the right motor cortex, and also whether right button presses are, you know, preferentially more active in the left motor cortex. That would be uh, an indication of a double dissociation. So you have to create two ROIs and extract the constituents from both of them to look for this kind of interaction. Now, ideally, if you're testing for a double dissociation, there's a few different criteria I recommend that you check out. The first one is um, in one of the regions, let's say, uh, let's say uh, I want to make the claim that there's a double dissociation between left and right button presses, between the left and right motor cortex. I would have to see that left is actually statistically greater than zero. And ideally, right would either, you know, not be statistically different from zero or even negative. And in this other one, just flip that exact same pattern. So it's testing for just any kind of behavioral interaction you would see with the typical behavioral data set. But these are very powerful because it allows you to make a stronger claim about the functional specificity of different regions. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, I made a claim about a double association even though uh, one of these conditions wasn't exactly zero or negative, but it met all the other criteria. There's a significant interaction, so I said that there was one. Other people may disagree with me. Oh, and also there should be a significant difference within each ROI between both of these conditions. So if I did p-test of this versus this, it should be 
a significant difference. Um, I'm not going to show you how to do a double association today, although if you're very motivated, uh, we definitely could you know, try to do it um, if you wanted to just create a couple different ROIs and then extract incongruent and congruent from each one separately. Um, that's really just saying what I was just saying. The reference I want to get for this, this is a paper by Neon Heiss et al. 2011. Basically outlining what I was just telling you. So if you want to make a claim about double association, for example, uh, you would need to you know, show that there are significant differences between both of the conditions. So this is in some study in mice. Imagine that this was brain activity in region A and region B. So technically this one probably be accepted as a double association because although there's a significant difference here, there's not a significant difference there. Uh, this was published in Nature Neuroscience actually. This is like a couple pages just about some basic statistical methods. And whenever somebody has tried to make a claim that they found a double association in a paper I'm reviewing and doesn't meet the criteria, this is always something I reference. So it's worth the read. It's, it's really not too complicated, but it's just recapitulating what I just said. Okay, um, last thing. By the way, in your terminal, just type something just to make sure we don't all get logged out. I forget, does, is it timed on an hour or something? Everybody's logged out? No? Oh, we're still okay. Um, I'm gonna just for a few minutes talk about neurosense. Oops. Yeah, has anybody come across this, Neurosense? Yeah. So this is a, it's a meta-analysis site which takes a bunch of different images and then uh, basically creates something that looks like this. So we could give it a label like emotion and then it gives all these voxels which seem to be Preferentially activated in emotion. Okay. Gives you a couple different ways. There's reverse inference, forward inference, but uh, they do complementary things. So somebody give me a search term that they want to look at. Anybody? Attention. Attention. Okay. 1800 studies. Let's take a look at that. All right, so for attention, if we're looking across all these studies, these are some of the voxels that you would see most active for that particular search term. If you wanted to, you could say this out as, let's see. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So if we just type that, click that, you would get a nifty data set, which you could then open and use that as uh, an ROI. Now it's going to output all these different voxels. So what you would do is, for example, in Apne's clusterize, which we used before, which showed you all the individual clusters, there's also an option to save it out as an individual ROI. You can also say what's here. Gives you a couple different connectivity maps. In case you're interested, so what is this most uh, significantly connected to? for covariance. Anyway, we'll get back to that in a second. Is this Tal's website? Yeah, Tal Yarconi. He's a colorful personality. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, got a, he's got a pretty cool blog, too. Recommend checking it out. <clears throat> Is it, do people do that or not? Um, like, um, yeah, make ROIs around something they found on your attention in papers? 
Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, actually something I did a couple years ago. Uh, yeah, so the request that I got from a reviewer was, you know, use Neurosense to define ROIs. Use the search terms because you're talking about prediction error, you're talking about conflict, and then, and pain, and then, uh, you know, within the medial prefrontal cortex, extract what the peaks were from that meta-analysis, and then draw spheres around that. And it worked. I mean, it replicated uh, the previous ROI analysis that we did. So it was pretty useful. Yeah. Pretty good stuff. Okay, so let's, so now that everybody is within their uh, Flanker directory, you should have the stats results folder copied over, right? Okay, everybody has that? Does anybody not have the stats results? Okay. So within stats results, what I've done is I've copied every subject's statistical data set into this directory. Now, if you had run that uh, pre-processing and first level script for every subject, you would get an output data set, an output stats data set for each subject. Um, because we didn't have time to go through all that, I just simply you know, collected all of them and put them into a single data set. Now I'm going to be using that 3D bucket command that we used before to concatenate uh, a specific sub Okay, into a data set. So first of all, if we want to know what's within, uh, let's say, one of these stats data sets, what command would we use? 3 info. Great. And importantly, I use this verb uh, option. Let me compress this. So verb stands for verbose, and it's going to output every single subric within that data set. And for an argument, I just give it a sample stats data set. Now, every one of these should be formatted the same way. Each one has the same regressors, so there shouldn't be any discrepancy between them. So let's say stats sub 01 plus TLRC, and then hit enter. OK, it gives you a lot of stuff. There's the history of everything that went into it down here. But if you scroll up, you should see what is in each individual sub brick. Yeah, so well, it, it really doesn't matter. It could be any one of the subjects. <coughs> okay, so we have the left side, we have congruent, incongruent. We also have the contrast of incongruent minus congruent. What, what does everybody want to extract for a subject? The 3D info, the input, uh, yeah. uh, flat verb, and the mm -hmm. input. Yep. Yeah. Anybody have any preference? Are we not doing a contrast? Yeah. We could. I mean, depends what you want. What's that? Yeah. yeah. So you want to, which one? Number two and number four. Number two and number four? Sound good? Okay. Wouldn't it be one if you Okay, yeah, you're right. What, yeah, one and four. Okay. All right, so let's, let's concatenate both uh, subricks one and subric four. Ow. This is what we're going to use to do it. So 3D bucket to create a concatenated data set. And then dash A glue two. So it's going to glue everything into a single data set. Now, so let's uh, first create that concatenated congruent data set. I'm going to call it congruent underscore betas. With 3D bucket, it's, it's kind of finicky. You need to give it both the view, so plus TLRC, and then dot head. For some reason, it, it's going to crash if you don't provide both of those. Plus TRC dot head. Okay. Actually, I apologize. 
uh, hit Control then C to, you know, erase that. Um, within your stats data set, do you have a subject list? Yeah. Is that in there? Okay, mm -hmm. let me make sure I'm on the same page with you all. Okay, so I have that as well. All right, we're actually going to be putting everything into a for loop. What I want you to do first is type TCSH and then hit return. Okay, what that's going to do is now everything that you type is going to be interpreted in T shell format. If I type bash and hit enter, I'd be in the bash shell and everything I typed would be interpreted in bash syntax. Now, because AFNI's default is TCSH, that is what we're going to use. Okay, so to start this for loop, type for each space. We're going to give it a variable that's going to be looped over everything. I just type subj or subj. And then in parentheses, backtick, which is in the upper left corner of your keyboard. Yeah. Uh, cat for concatenate, subj list.txt, another backtick, and another parenthesis. When you've typed all that and hit return, you should see a prompt that says for each question mark, asking for input. Any problems so far? We're good. Okay. So now we're going to use the three bucket command to loop over every subject to concatenate all their beta maps into a single data set. So type 3D bucket dash a glue to. And again, I can call this whatever I want. I'm going to call it congruent underscore betas plus trc dot head. Okay. Now here's a tricky part. We're going to use some uh, shell scripting notation with the dollar signs, right? So remember, everything is formatted the same way. All these stats data sets. The only thing that changes is in the middle, you know, sub 12, sub 13, 14, all the way up to sub 26. So I'm going to type stats dot uh, dollar sign subj plus trc dot head single quotation left bracket and then what was that beta was it one one okay right bracket and then another Single quotation. Just for my sake, I want to make sure that I actually got this right. Sometimes, even I forget. Um, was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that should all be good. Oh, just so you know, that, that extract beta's uh, script, that would work if you ran it from the from the pointer directory if you had analyzed every subject's directory using that script I gave you. Because everything would be output into a subject results directory. Yeah, yeah. How come you're using dot head and not just dot get both for Um you you could omit that extension. Uh, I like to include it just because it seems to be safer. When okay. when you have the, the dot head extension it points towards the header, which in turn will be able to point towards where in the brick or the raw info all the data is that you need. Okay. Yeah. And as for uh, blue two, a blue two, you need to have both the TLRC and the .head in order to um, for it to work. If you don't have it for some reason, it fails. What is okay. a glue two do? What's that? Did you, did you say? I'm sorry. What is oh, a glue two? So. In the first pass, it's going to say, does this data set exist? If not, you know, create it using whatever the first like, map that we uh, generate and just you know, put that into that. 
And then on the next run through, it says, does this exist? It does. So add whatever comes next to that and just okay. keep gluing it to that same data set. So it's going to keep, keep getting bigger. And you didn't have that with make individual? Yeah. If you, if you didn't have a glue to, it would it would basically try to be overriding this. It would throw an error. Oh, yeah. got it. Yeah. So press enter. That's the middle of the for loop. And then to close the for loop, type end, and then press enter. And it's okay. You're going to see warning. That's okay. It's just letting you know it's overriding the data set, but that is simply adding to the data set. It's overriding it, but it's just simply adding one more brick to it. Okay, if we want to check to make sure that... It, what? Is that a laugh of terror? <laughs> Desperation? Okay. Yeah, it all seemed to be pretty good. The only thing I was seeing was some of the errors. Mostly it's a typo. So first of all, AFNI is case sensitive. So if, say, head wasn't capitalized, it would throw an error. If something was misspelled or you use single quotes instead of back ticks, it'll throw an error. It's very finicky. And if there's just one thing out of place, it unfortunately it will, will crash. I'm sure you still want to use AFNI. <laughs> SPM doesn't do that. No. Um, I think I think we're all up to speed though, right? Okay. So let's. Now I'm going to leave it up to you, <laughs> if you want. Who feels confident enough that they can extract the incongruent betas? What else do you need? <laughs> That's the only other thing that we need. Yeah. Extract the incongruent phase. Yeah? And what is the name of the output? Is the same, but with incongruent? Right. Yeah. So the only thing that we're going to change, yeah, remember, subric 4 was incongruent. <laughs> I'm just going to give you a few minutes. Try it. It's OK. If it, you know, something goes wrong, try again. If it's still going wrong, feel free to ask ask me or somebody else. If you're doing it, you're flying on your own. Okay. Let's get settled. Ready to proceed? All right. Uh, so I'm going to do this on my computer. Here's the answer key. Uh, what was it for? For incongruent? Okay. Just so you know, so I spelled it, you know, congruent capitalized. I'm also going to spell incongruent, the first letter capitalized. So, yours may look slightly different, but. So now, let's actually double check that that did what we thought it should do. So you should have congruent betas and incongruent betas. Now, to make sure that it extracted the way that we thought it should, Again, let's type 3D info dash verb, and then let's say congruent betas, and then hit enter. Now, if you scroll up, again, it gives you a lot of different output. Scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Here's what I'm most interested in. Uh, let's see here. Uh, basically, I'm just checking the history to make sure that it went through each subject sequentially. And it did. It's just a sanity check. You don't need to if you're pretty confident that it, it did the right thing, but that's always something I like to do. Now, next step, we're going to create a sphere around those peak coordinates I was showing you before. Right above you, if you type ls dot dot, you should have this... Uh, make wait, wait, create sphere script. Yeah. Yes. Nope. No. <laughs> one folder. One, one directory above. Ls dot dot. Do you see create sphere? If you don't, we can just type it out. But just save some time. You don't see it. Sorry. Who 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 doesn't see create sphere? It's 
flanker Yeah, it should be yeah. in the flanker directory if we copied everything yesterday. <coughs> Okay. So, still don't see it? I, I think I know where it is. But it'll, it'll be okay. The class, I <laughs> okay, but nobody else, nobody else is having that problem. Okay. So let's actually create this here. Wait, Salah, are you good? Okay. What I want you all to do is we're going to... We are going to copy. We're going to copy create sphere into our current directory. So it's going to look like cp dot dot slash create sphere and then one dot to represent the current working directory. Now to see what's actually in it, I'm going to type cat create sphere. Again, this is what I had in my slides. Just a little bit of uh, commentary represented by the hashtags. So those are the coordinates I'm going to use, 0, 20, 44. And it's going to create something called conflict RY. If you wanted to, you could edit this. You could call it something else. You could change this triplet if you want to represent some other coordinates. It's really up to you. But for now, we're going to use those ones. So if you type TCSH create sphere, it says total number of voxels filled is 19. So in other words, we have 19 voxels within the sphere. And it's going to be in this file called conflict ROI. Okay. Now, also, you have MNI AVG 152, one directory above, yeah? You should? Yeah. Let's also copy that into the current directory. So, MNI AVG 152. I'm using tab and then a, a wildcard to get both the head and the brick, and then a dot to represent the current working directory. Are you guys, that's good, Chris? All right. OK, now type AFNI, hit Enter. We're going to go back into the AFNI viewer. And for our underlay, select your MNI template. So it probably should be the first one that pops up. You should be fine. And then for the overlay, what we're going to see is that conflict ROI. So you can double click on it, you can click set, whatever you want. Con conflict ROI is what should have been created. I always double check the ROIs I create, especially in AFNI because that whole RAI, LPI orientation thing. But if it did it correctly, it should, it should be in the area where I think it should be. If there's some orientation problem, it might be over here or maybe somewhere on the side of the brain. This is just to double check to make sure it is where it should be. I use the AFNI viewer all the time just to make sure nothing went totally wrong. OK, now the actual ROI analysis part, there's one more step. We're going to use 3D mask av to average over all of the voxels within this ROI for all of those contrast maps that we strung together in both congruent and incongruent. I'm going to close out of the AFNI viewer. Okay. And there's no script. We're just going to type out the actual command. So I'm going to type 3D mask av. The options are one, it needs a mask or an ROI to extract from. So I type dash mask. And, oops. Conflict on. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the input for that, I'm going to give that conflict ROI. If you use the ROI flag, you just get its coordinates? Uh, I, I don't have any issues to use the ROI flag. <laughs> I didn't know there was an ROI flag. Oh, I thought you said you could use an ROI or never mind. Oh, we created this from coordinates. We, we right. expanded yeah. the sphere around some coordinates, and this contains all the voxels that we can use for a mask. Got it. Sorry. And then the last thing is, let's say, the uh, congruent betas. Let's do that for now. 
and hit return. And if everything worked, you should see something like this. Does everybody see something like this? Yeah. OK, awesome. Who can tell me what this, what this first line that was output means? Negative 0.067. What is what does that represent? What does that mean? For subject one, for subject one, yeah, the average beta weights across that R line for subject one, and we get one number per subject. Now notice you also get some additional information like 19 voxels. Right, yeah. So that just represents how many voxels are extracted from. Now, if you're going to input this into something like Excel or R, usually you don't want to see that 19 voxels thing. It's really it's disruptive. So press up to go back to this. Um, use your left cursor to go back here and insert a quiet flag and also a space between that and congruent. If then you hit enter, you should see the string of numbers, but now without that 19 boxes. At this point, at this point, you've done an ROI analysis. So if you want, uh, let's see if I, okay. There's no way in hell I'm going to have everybody try to copy all this to their home directory on their current machine, then run Excel. You're just going to watch me, okay, because we're not going to deal with any of that, any of that craziness. Yeah, thank God. So what I would do, I would just copy, paste all of this. You could, I'm, I'm using Excel. You could use R, whatever you want, SPSS, and then, whoops. Mash destination formatting. You know, I start to organize it like I would a typical spreadsheet. So I have all my numbers for the congruent condition, and now I'm going to again ask you to do <coughs> the same thing with the incongruent betas. So try it, try it, fail, try again, still having problems. Let somebody know. So extract from same mask, the conflict mask, but the incongruent betas. Anyway, if you're still working, that's okay. I'm just going to show you how I would be doing this on my end. It's not terribly complicated. Just give it the incongruent betas. Copy and paste them. I would just do something like that. And then if you want to do any kind of test, for example, uh, here's... Here's one option. We do something like t-test this one compared to this one. Say so two tails would be a pair t-test as a type. And this is a p-value is what I get. So 0.02. That's significant? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Incongruence greater than congruence. Yeah. All right, but um, something else I would recommend if you're doing your ROI analyses would also be to do something like, uh, you know, take the average of each of these. Oops, take the average congruent, take the average uh, incongruent, and then you can simply plot them the way you would in Excel. It's actually been a while. I don't know how to create the. Okay. Is it this? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I said, okay, something like this. You could also calculate standard error, add error bars, but, you know, basically you'd say, yeah, incongruent is greater than congruent. But if I, had, if I had to guess, congruent is still actually significantly greater than zero. So, you know, that would be the caveat. You'd have to say, if I had just extracted the contrast, I wouldn't get the full picture. Right? I would say, yeah, incongruent is greater than congruent, but what's driving the effect is that incongruent is greater than congruent, and they're both positive. That's an important thing to know. People want to know what is driving your interaction or your contrast. Another cool thing with this ROI analysis, if I had something like a contrast, let's say I had um, 
you know, I had levels of, say, uh, what would be a good one? High and low, high incongruence, high incongruent, uh, low congruent, low incongruent. I, I crossed it somehow. I'd extract all of them, and then I could plot all of them to see if there was some kind of interaction <coughs> going on, if you could picture that. So that's why ROI analysis is so powerful and so useful. Uh, now, if I were to extract from the subgroup that contained the beta estimate for incongruent minus congruent, what do you think that would look like? If you had to guess, what do you think the size of that contrast effect would be, given what we're seeing here? Yeah, just be the difference between these two things. So I could do that. I could certainly uh, extract the incongruent minus congruent uh, contrast map from that same ROI. And it would simply be the difference at each of these. So I'll quickly go through that. No need to follow along. But you know, I check where is that particular uh, contrast map. So incongruent minus congruent, the coefficient is subric 7. So what I'm going to do is, let's see here, go up, want to daisy chain all these together. I'm use, going to use subric 7. And make sure I caught the correct thing. Give it my conflict mask, and then incongruent minus congruent. So is this in fact true? Do I get the difference between the two? Survey says yes. And we can prove it by simply taking the difference between this one, or actually this is the wrong direction. Yeah, this one minus this one. Yeah. yeah. Do they match? Yes, they do. Does that make sense? OK, is that clicking? Everything that we've done, what the contrast maps look like, what the individual components look like, how we create the ROI, how we extract from it. OK, awesome. Let's break for, let's do a 10 minute break. You guys have been doing a lot. Do you, do, okay, does anybody not need that much time? I mean, <laughs> we've just been doing a lot and trying to make sure. We're on time. We'll, we'll be, we're doing fine. Okay, let's reconvene at uh, 10.43. I'm going to say a few words about bias ROI analyses, um, and then we'll start to do graph theory.